some things that perhaps directly relate to conscience. Um, this evening we're going to hopefully take a bit of an overview um, of, of what conscience means um, and, and try and set, set it in, it, in its wide, wider context um, about what we do um, and about what God teaches us about how we act. Um, so really going to focus on, on the wider context and the first five or ten minutes it really is going to be the wide context before we try and um, hone in on, on a couple of um, key texts which hopefully teaches um, a bit more about conscience specifically. Um, so there, there are many uh, practical issues that we face um, in life. So some of them are, are perhaps daily, some every few weeks, um, some perhaps once in a lifetime. Um, and we perhaps ask the question, well, how am I going to deal with this? And, and hopefully when we ask that sort of question um, and we, we come to scripture uh, because we know that it instructs us in, in righteousness. So when we come to these decisions that we need to make in life, hopefully we come to scripture. But as disciples of Christ, when we come to scripture, we find we don't find a rule book which says in all these circumstances you must do X, Y and Z. And sometimes we find it difficult to know how to apply different parts to um, different scenarios that we find um, in our lives. And perhaps one of the first things I'm just going to put on this screen is, is from Galatians 2, which perhaps is the sort of o overarching theme that is Paul writes there at the end of, towards the end of an argument in relation to circumcision and the keeping of the law. And he says, for through the law I die to the law, so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, Paul explains that he lives by faith. And that is the overarching principle, which he described not only in Galatians, but elsewhere in the New Testament. He lives by faith. Um, and although we don't find a rule book when we come to scripture, um, we do find that there are some things which God views as not right, as evil. So the first thing I want to do is come and have a look at Mark chapter 7. Um, to just explore uh, some ideas around this. So although we, we live by faith, and that is our overarching kind of principle, that, that's, the, that's the main thing, that's not to say there are some things which God uh, views as evil. In Mark chapter 7, um, the Pharisees come to, uh, come to Jesus and they're asking, well, why don't your disciples have to wash their hands before they eat? And we provide a bit of context that the Pharisees, before they eat, they have to wash their hands and they wash uh, the, the cups and everything related to um, their eating. And Jesus' response is very forceful. In Mark 7 verse 6, he says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, and it is written, this people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Sorry, uh, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandments of God, you hold to the tradition of men. So... His answer to the Pharisees about why the disciples don't wash their hands is very strong. Um, and he then puts a parable in verse 14 and 15. He says, after he called the crowd to him again, he began, to, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing out of, out, outside the man which can defile him if it goes in, into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And in fact, what happens is the crowd go away 
but the disciples haven't understood what Jesus has said. And so verse 17 says that his disciples questioned him about the parable. Put on the screen um, these, these next few verses. Um, and this is what Jesus' response is to the disciples' question, an explanation of this parable. He says, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatsoever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. And so Jesus um, tries to gives an explanation um, of, of the parable. He says anything that's um, from outside the man... Um, it can't defile him. So these washing of hands, it's not really something that can actually defile you because it's from outside. He says the things that do defile you, oops, sorry, try again. Better. Uh, so the things that do defile you, they're the things that come out of your heart. Um, and they're the evil thoughts, the fornications, thefts. And so there's a really clear distinction made between the things that from outside enter into us. He says they can't defile you. The things that will defile you and which he describes as all these evil things are <coughs> the fornications, the thefts and the murders. So we find there is clearly things that God views as evil. Um, let's try and <coughs> illustrate this. Um, we saw in those verses the reactions and characteristics of the flesh. They come out of the heart. They are evil. There is no question. In certain contexts, they're not right or wrong. They are evil things in God's sight. Um, on the other hand, um, if we were to carry on from in, in Galatians, from that quote in Galatians, um, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And they're all characteristics which he describes as being the fruits of the Spirit. Um, and I'm sorry this looks like the French flag backwards, it <laughs> wasn't intentional. Um, but what I'm going to suggest is that we do have this bit in the middle. So, so there are actions and characteristics which are evil things and that is how God views them um, and there are characteristics which can fairly be described as the fruit of the spirit um, what we want to consider for the rest of the evening and we will, may consider uh, next Thursday um, is this bit in the middle is there a bit in the middle and what do we do with it um, if there is um, so Perhaps um, at this point, we think about what is conscience and um, what does conscience mean? Um, it's the subject um, over the next couple of evenings, but what does it actually mean? Um, can you just turn to the person next to you or behind you, depending on where you're sitting, and just for the next 60 seconds, try and come up with a definition, and I'll just ask a couple of people to give their definitions, of what conscience means. Um, it's more difficult, I found it more difficult this time than I thought it might be. So, 60 seconds, off we go. Um, what does the dictionary say? Um, what do we mean by today? Uh, someone's pleasing themselves over there. Um, this is what the Oxford English Dictionary says. A person's moral sense of right and wrong viewed as acting as a guide to one's behaviour. Um, I think... Um, that's, that's kind of what you were saying, Lawrence, and, and others that put a, put a similar definition. And what we find, I think, is that, um, that that's today's definition. And when we look at um, definition um, that was current 50 AD, 
um, the inward faculty of distinguishing right and wrong. Um, I've put a summary at the bottom, which maybe encapsulates a bit of what you were saying, John, um, a bit of what everyone else was saying. Self-awareness that judges whether or not one has acted in harmony with one's own moral standards. Um, so that's what conscience is. It's quite a difficult thing for us to define. We, we talk about having a guilty conscience or about something being on one's conscience. Um, but when it comes to defining it, I, I think it is, it is a bit of a challenge, but hopefully that's useful in giving us a bit of a feel and a definition of, of what we're talking about. So in the New Testament, um, what do we find when we think about conscience? Um, should we just turn to this? Uh, 1 Timothy 1. Um, we're going to put three on the screen, but let's turn to this first one. So Paul is writing to Timothy, and in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And he refers to people who were teaching strange <coughs> doctrines. And he tells Timothy, don't pay attention to those things. Um, in verse 4, he says, Nor pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So the goal of what uh, Paul was teaching Timothy um, was a pure heart a good conscience and a sincere faith. Um, the, the pure heart perhaps reminds us of what Jesus is talking about in, in Mark, that the things which proceed out of our heart are, can be evil things, but what we're seeking is a pure heart and a good conscience. I should put a couple more on the screen. Hebrews 9 verse 14. Um, it says, how much more will the blood of Christ, as compared with bulls and goats, how much more will the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Um, or later on in Hebrews, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the end goal of what we're trying to seek for as disciples of Christ, um, it is a good conscience, is a pure conscience, which is associated with a sincere heart, a pure heart, a heart of faith. So we saw in Mark there are things that are clearly evil, no matter the context. As disciples of Christ, those actions of thefts, of murders, they are evil things. And our goal is to have this clear conscience, this, this good conscience um, that Timothy describes. So what we want to think about now is that bit in the middle, whether there is that bit in the middle between those things which are always evil in God's sight, between... Um, the fruits of the Spirit. Of course, we always remember that we, we live by faith, and, and that's the overarching principle. But there are those things which, which God views as evil. So what we want to do for the rest of the time uh, is look at two passages in the New Testament. Um, first is going to be 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, and, and then a section from Romans. Um, so... First of all, 1 Corinthians. Um, just a bit, of, a bit of background to 1 Corinthians, um, first of all. Um, we can very broadly divide up 1 Corinthians, um, as I've shown on the screen. It, it, it's not exact, and you could play around with it, but as a broad overview. Uh, we, we've got a, a short introduction, the first 10 or so verses of 1 Corinthians, um, Paul then responds to some oral reports um, that he had received about the church. Um, and then there are a series of things that 
are responded to, which are described as a response to the things that the Corinthians had written to Paul. And finally, uh, we have a conclusion to the letter. Um, the, the section we want to look at is a section which responds to some things that the Corinthians had put to Paul. Um, if we have a look at 1 Corinthians um, chapter 7 and verse 1. He says, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. So, clearly, Corinthians had written a letter to Paul and a response is given. And it, it starts with this phrase, now concerning the things. Um, and what we find is that phrase is then used again and again in 1 Corinthians to introduce these new sections. Um, and the key one that I want to consider um, for a few minutes this evening um, is between chapter 8, verse 1, and 11, verse 1, uh, when he begins, now concerning things sacrificed to idols. So we don't have that letter that uh, the Corinthians are written to Paul, um, but we gather there was something about idol meat um, that they were concerned about. Um, why might they have been concerned about this? Well, Corinth was probably the biggest, it was the biggest city um, of, of ancient Greece. It, it was bigger than Athens um, at the time of Paul. Um, and there's a, a map there of central Corinth, um, broadly, as at the time of Paul. Um, and on the right, there's some stone-looking structures um, that were the, the top and the bottom uh, pictures are of temples. Um, the place was filled with temples. Um, if you've got really good eyesight, you'll see that there's little uh, figures, one, two, three, four, and if you had the things that, the sort of, the other side of that, which said what those one, two, three, four things are, um, you'd find that probably half of them are temples that have been uncovered. So the place was full of temples. And we know that on those temples um, we had idol meat um, being sacrificed. So Corinth had huge swathes of pagan temples which were used in the worship of idols. Uh, and that worship involved the sacrificing of an animal to the pagan deity before eating the meat. Um, so, yes, this was a type of religious worship, but those feasts were not just religious. Uh, they had a really key social function um, in Corinth. Um, there were different understandings of, of what those um, partakers of the feast felt that they were doing, but most likely um, they fundamentally saw them as feasts, as social feasts, which had a bit to do with a pagan god on the side. They were primarily about social association. And that's what went on in, in some of these temples. And in the middle, um, I don't know how well, how well you can see it, but in the middle you've got a photo of what's left of the agora, of the marketplace. And so some of the meat that was left over, it was very close by, you know, you could walk in 20 seconds from the temple uh, and drop it onto the marketplace. And perhaps the significance of that we'll see a bit later on in, in Corinthians. Um, so that is the context to the Corinthian I idol issue that they, they had. The place was filled with idol temples and we can perhaps we can hopefully appreciate why that might have been an issue for them. So thinking then about um, chapters chapter eight verse one through until eleven verse one, I've suggested a way we can we can perhaps think about the this overall structure. Um, in chapter eight, um, 
the problem is described uh, about idols and some of the key principles at work that of knowledge of what an idol is, uh, but about what our reaction should be. And the overriding um, reaction is of love for our brothers and sisters. In chapter 9, we have Paul's example, what Paul did in relation to some of these things. Um, at the start of chapter 9, he says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? And there is perhaps a, a bit of a digression, but in verse 19 of chapter 9, we come back to the same thing. He says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win the Jews. And he concludes in verse 22, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I might become a fellow partaker of it. So that was Paul's example uh, and how he dealt with some of these things. Um, in, in chapter 10, and particularly verse 1 to 30, it moves back to think about Israel's example in the context of idols. Um, and then from verse 14 to 22, looks at the Lord's Supper and how that might affect our view of partaking of idol meat in the idol temple. And finally, um, there are some practical uh, examples of what the Corinthian might do in particular circumstances. Um, what I want to do is go through chapter 8 and we'll sort of broadly read it through um, and try and understand what the argument is. Um, we then have a bit of a comparison with the other passage um, in, in the New Testament in Romans that we want to think about and then compare the two so we can try and determine those things that they did um, in the first century. What are the common themes um, which we can perhaps apply to ourselves now when we're thinking about conscience? Um, so I, I put some text on, on the screen but which may or, or may not help you to, to follow um, and I'm, I'm going to read off there as we go through so he begins chapter 8 now concerning things sacrificed no, sorry now concerning things offered unto idols we know that we all have knowledge knowledge puffs up but love builds up if anyone thinks he knows anything you know nothing yet according as it is necessary to know but if anyone love God the same is known by him. So the, the first thing uh, he, he talks about is, is about idols in themselves. And you see, if I put, we know that we all have knowledge in quotation marks. Um, I, I suggest that's probably one of the slogans that the Corinthians used. That they said, um, we can sacrifice this idols, these idols because we know that we all, all have knowledge. Um, what that knowledge is, I think will become clear um, later in the chapter. So we have a bit about idols in themselves. And then in verse 4, concerning therefore the eating of the things offered unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, there is one God, the Father. So, yes, we know the knowledge that they had was that there is no real thing as an idol. There is no real God associated with that. There is just one God, the Father. What it goes on to explain, though, is that that knowledge that there is one God and that idols are nothing wasn't in everyone. And he says, but some being accustomed to the idol until, until now, eat as of a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So that brother or sister was going to 
the idol temple and still felt, because they were accustomed to seeing it as an idol, they still felt they were sacrificing to an idol. They, they still, still saw it as a, a real thing. And so because of that, their, their conscience was defiled because that was, they recognized that that was evil. What he goes on to say is that meat does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat do we abound, neither if we eat not do we lack. So meat doesn't do anything to us. Um, if we have meat, um, it doesn't make us great. And if we don't have meat, then we don't lack anything. And I think that would be a, a key principle. Um, and that's why I suggest we have this kind of this middle, that, that bit of question mark where there are things that are not evil, that don't make us lack or abound, and, and they're not good in themselves. They're not like joy, love, peace, or spiritual characteristics. They are in the middle. Um, but what are the principles that are brought to bear on this? He says, but be careful that somehow this freedom of yours become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who has knowledge reclining in an idle temple, will not the conscience of him being weak be built up so as to eat things offered unto idols? And the weak brother for whom Christ died will perish on your knowledge. Now, when you are sinning this way against the brethren and wounding their weak conscience, you are sinning against Christ. Wherefore, if meat cause my brother to fall down, I will not eat flesh at all forever, that I may not cause my brother to fall down. So there was a recognition that, yes, idols are nothing. There is no real God behind the idol. There is one God. And yes, the, the meat from those idols is not going to make us great um, or, or cause us to lack. The real issue was that there are some who still had a conscience of the idol. They still saw them as something when they partook of the idol meat. And the problem was that was going to cause them to stumble. And if it was going to cause them to stumble, then the reaction um, of those who were okay with uh, partaking of that meat should have been to pull back from that and say, well, my brother or sister, Christ dies for them. I'm not going to go and just partake of the meat because I know I'm free to do so and, I, and I've got this knowledge that it's okay if I'm going to cause my brother to stumble. Moving over to some of the practical examples, and I appreciate we're, we're skipping over quite, quite a section here, right, right to the end, in fact. Um, but I just want to consider some of the instruct specific instruction that Paul gave um, to the Corinthians. Um, in verse 23 um, of 1 Corinthians 10, he says, All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbour. And then there are three specific instructions given. Number one, whatsoever is sold in the market, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Number two, now, if any of them that believe not invite you and you wish to go, so that's probably the context of those uh, social feasts which were common in, in ancient Corinth, and you wish to go, all that is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. I'm going to suggest that then there's this third part. But if anyone say to you, this is offered in sacrifice to an idol, so whilst you're there, someone comes and points out and says, well, hold on, this, this has been sacrificed to an idol. Then he says, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. And then that is the end of the third part. And, and he goes back to the reason for, for the second point. All that is set before you eat, asking no questions for conscience' sake. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? But if I, with thanks, partake, why am I evil spoken of for what I give thanks? So those are the three uh, kind of rules um, that, that are given to the Corinthians. But again, it goes back to the overriding principle. 
says, whether therefore you eat or drink or anything you do, do all things unto God's glory. Give no stumbling block, both to Jews and Greeks and the ecclesia of God. According as I in all things please, not seeking the profit of myself, but that of the many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, according as I also of Christ. So he gave some specific instruction in relation to this matter of conscience, that of eating idle meat. But then he goes back to the overriding principle. Whatever you do, whether it's eating or drinking or anything else, do it to God's glory. Further, in anything that you do, don't make it a stumbling block, something that someone else is going to go and trip over and is going to bring them down in their faith. And then we've got Paul's own example, which we would see in chapter 9. Everything he had, every opportunity he had, he didn't use to please himself, although he recognised he had freedom in Christ. He didn't use it to just go and do what he wanted to do. He used it to further the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. So those are some of the key things um, in relation to conscience in 1 Corinthians 8. Um, If you leave something in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10, um, would you mind coming across to Romans? We'll just spend um, a few moments looking at what Romans says in relation to this um, and then try and draw some conclusions based on on, on what they say. Um, Romans 14 describes a different, but what I think we'll see is similar situation. So they're not, they're definitely not identical. There are some clear differences between what's happening in Rome and what was happening in Corinth. But what I think we will see is there are some uh, clear similarities which will hopefully enable us to build some sort of framework as to how we deal with these um, matters of, of conscience, this, this bit in the middle. Um, he begins by saying, in Romans 14, verse 1, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, um, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. So we have a distinction made between the, uh, the weak and those who will eat all things. The weak only eat vegetables, and the others uh, will eat meat. They'll, they'll eat everything. And the instruction to the Romans was, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who doesn't eat, for God has accepted him. So there is to be some mutual respect between those who would eat all things and those who would only eat vegetables. We have another example in verse 5. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. So again, we've got someone will esteem every day alike, he'll think they're all the same, and another person um, thinks one day is more important than another. He doesn't come down on either side, he says that you should be fully persuaded in your own mind about what you do. Um, we're going to come down to verse 10 to, again, some of the principles which are at play. Why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put a stumbling, sorry, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. So, like we had in Corinth, the overriding theme was that you shouldn't put a stumbling block or an obstacle or something for, to bring someone down in your brother's way. He goes on to say in verse 14, I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So like we had in uh, Jesus' uh, explanation of the parable, 
that the washing of hands didn't make you clean or, or better. It couldn't defile your heart. Of themselves, they were nothing. But if you felt that it was something and that it was an issue, then that's okay. We've, you have to work with that. And it's in particular the person that thinks they can eat everything that's got to be very careful. Because verse 15, for if because of, your, because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. <coughs> Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. The language is very strong, isn't it? To, to destroy the person um, for whom Christ died. It's exactly the same language that we had in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Again, verse 20. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offence. One final bit from Romans. I'm going to skip down to the end of the section, um, which is in chapter 15 and verse 5. He says, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another. To grant you, uh, sorry, grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Again, that's kind of how Corinthians finishes, isn't it? The overriding principle, you do it to the glory of God. So, let's try and summarise some of those things. Um, in both places, it, it refers to saying all things are ev- uh, sorry, all things are, are lawful, all things are clean. So, in one person's eyes, it was true. All things were clean. And also it was true that an idol is nothing. There was no real God behind that idol. Uh, And likewise, in relation to food or days, there was nothing that was unclean in and of itself. In Corinth, it describes them as being accustomed to idols. That had been, they, we know that they, they were mostly a, a pagan um, ecclesia in Corinth. So they were accustomed to idols. Uh, and likewise, if someone thought a bit of food was unclean, ritually, then to them, it's unclean. Um, in Corinth, food doesn't commend us to God. It doesn't make us better or worse because we partake of the meat. Um, and I think a similar theme is coming through in, in Romans 14 and 15, where he says, don't tear down the work of God for the sake of food. You know, food is nothing, therefore don't go and tear down your brother um, by taking of it. Um, we found that in Corinth, the partaking of the idol meat in the idol temple could cause a stumbling block. And... Paul's instruction in Romans is don't cause a stumbling block by going and taking this unclean food. Just because you know it's fine, that's not how your brother views it. And finally, the point we noted in both, he says, whatsoever you do, whether you eat or or drink, uh, do all to the glory of God. And that's how we saw Romans end. So there are some differences between what was happening in Corinth and what was happening in Rome. Um, The type of food was was different. In in Rome, they're talking about uh, ritually clean and unclean meats versus vegetables. Um, In Rome, sorry, in Corinth, they're talking about food that had been associated with idol worship. And the word conscience is not used anywhere in Romans. Um, or at least certainly not in Romans 14 and 15. But there are still some key points that come out um, of both, which try to uh, illustrate um, on the screen. So the question is, uh, I think 
If I was in, in Corinth in the time of Paul and that letter had just been written to me, I think I'd probably roughly know how to go about acting in relation to idol meat. And likewise, if I, if I was in Romans, there was those there was issues about food. I think, yeah, uh, I'd, I'd know what, what to do about that. Um, but today, idol food, meat that's been offered to an idol, or unclean meats or clean meats, is not really an issue for us. They're, they're not something that we come across. So our difficulty is trying to get across from these bits, this question mark in the middle that they had in the first century to some of the things today. What are the similarities? So I'm just going to offer a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, um, in Corinthians, it doesn't actually just talk about idol meat. It is opened out to, to other things. For example, um, we read from 1 Corinthians 9, um, where he says that, so the weak I became weak that I might win the weak, I become all things to all men. So this isn't just about idol meat. This was about a wider principle. Likewise, uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And finally, in the context of Romans, um, in Romans 14, verse 21, he says it's good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. So whilst the focus of these bits in Romans and in Corinthians are on uh, f unclean or, or clean food um, and idle meat, they are, we can extend them to other things. And I suggest we extend them to those things which fit some of these uh, categories and principles. There are those things in the middle which don't commend us to God because we do them or don't do them. We recognise that, as we said at the start, there are some things which God does view as evil, like murder like theft and that's not what these issues are about that's not what conscience is about this is about those things which don't commend us to God if we do them and they don't take us away from God if we don't do them so I think that's one uh, point of similarity that if we're thinking about something which we think might be a matter of conscience today that's the kind of um, category it might fall under one of the other consistent things was about it causing a stumbling block. So if it's an issue which may be fine for us, but which might cause a stumbling block, is going to cause someone else to fall down and either lose their face, faith or their practice, um, then perhaps we need to be thinking about the principles that, that come out of Corinthians. Um, and the overriding thing in all this is that all those things which we may consider fall into this category, um, we've got to serve our brothers and sisters first. Um, we do it to the glory of God because we do it for the sake of our brothers and sisters. We, we don't seek to please ourselves. Um, I'm not going to be bold enough to suggest anything that today falls into that category. You may be bold enough to do so uh, in, in discussion. Um, one of the reasons I don't do that, or I mean, I, I'm not going to do that here, um, is as soon as we say, well, yeah, this definitely fits into that category, um, what we'll probably find is that someone will come along and say, well, no, it clearly doesn't fit into that category. It's clearly evil, and you clearly can't do it. And that, to me, is one of the biggest challenges from this in Romans and Corinthians. Trying to distinguish between those things which are evil. They proceed out of the heart, 
and God all, will always view them as evil versus those things that really are in the middle, that don't commend us to God or take us away from God. Um, we're going to be considering next week um, perhaps some of those issues. Um, and we'll perhaps need to consider which parts of those topics fall into which category. Um, if we were talking about theft next week, we would know it's not really about conscience. That is evil. It proceeds out of our heart if we go and take from someone else. Um, but maybe there are other things that we'll see which do fall into the middle, over which some may find challenge with and find difficulty with, and therefore they, they don't associate themselves with it, but others would be willing to do so. But those that are willing to do so would have to look at the wider context of what they're doing and say, well, what's the effect on my brother or my sister on, on doing this? Um, one final note. Um, in Corinthians and in Rome, um, Paul doesn't seek to persuade the weak to become strong. Um, he doesn't say to them, look, you really not need to stop being weak and realise that it's nothing and that you can be strong. Um, and I think that's partially a perplexing thing. Um, we think it'd be good to be strong in faith in the context of Romans 14, but he never tells us that that is what we need to go and do to persuade the weak. Um, perhaps um, in, in reading this and understanding some of the principles, um, we, we get to understand better that some of the things, these things don't matter. They don't commend us to God or not. Um, I, I hope that is useful to an extent. Um, and as I say, I've not suggested anything which falls into this category, but what I hope I've done is give us a bit of a framework to work within when, we think, when we're thinking about some of the things that might fall to be uh, matters of conscience. Thank you.